what's also clear is that if you look on average um, for the past 20 years, agriculture has grown 3% compared to 2% in the general economy. So that's, that's a significant difference in terms of, of outpacing the general economy um, in terms of growth. What's also clear is that it has slowed quite a bit um, in recent years. So the chart I just brought up shows you some individual sectors in the economy. Basically, looking from 2017 to 2023 in green, um, and there you can see agriculture right at the bottom, the second best performer of the lot. Um, and then the blue one shows just the past three years, and then this doesn't look quite so good anymore. Then we've dropped to third from the bottom. So you can see that growth in agriculture has slowed significantly. But I think if you just look at, at that chart in general, it also shows a clear ability to bounce back, the resilience of the sector, to come back after the sector takes, takes these knocks. And there's some factors highlighted there in terms of what's driven growth. Um, we've had commodity price cycles, weather conditions internationally, weather conditions in South Africa. Um, obviously, things like, like the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, things that we don't control as agriculture. But there's also been some factors within the sector that have, have been particularly constraining, things like animal disease outbreaks and so forth, which we argue that we can do something about. Um, so all of this, I think, just to bear this picture in mind as we start um, looking forward then. So let's do that by way of, of subsector for now. So what you show, again, what you see on screen is in real terms, so adjusted for inflation, and that's revenue. So it doesn't consider costs as of yet. But it gives you some view of the sectors that, that drove performance historically and also how we see them going forward. And I think, again, it's quite clear if you think these past few years when agriculture did so well, it was very much underpinned by the field crop sector, that, that blue line. You know, we were in a situation where we had fantastic yields, we had very high world prices. It's a combination that we don't always see together. And I think we really benefited from that. The reality is also that we will come down from that um, because many of those external factors aren't around anymore. Um, so, so we have to be realistic about that. Um, I think what's, what's good to see is if you look at a previous low price cycle, while prices are coming down again, we're entering into a next lower price cycle, we don't fall to the level that we were in those previous low price cycles. And, and I think that speaks to the investments made in the upswing that then enable us to, to plateau out a little bit higher than what we did before. We know there will be volatility in future. We don't see it here because much of it is weather-induced. But if we can keep doing this, we can keep this cycle, we can keep investing in the good cycles, we can keep landing higher in the next down cycle. If you also look back, previous down cycle was good for livestock because that's, of course, what gives us, us the animal feed. But we would argue that in those previous cycles, the general demand environment and the economic um, environment for our consumers was a little bit stronger. So we don't see that same extent of growth, particularly in the short term currently, um, because of that constraint. But of course, if we end up in Shannon's more positive scenario, then this can look a little bit different. So we have to also acknowledge that. The last one is then horticulture, um, which is an interesting sector. I and mean, if you look 10, 15 years back, it was, it was our core driver of growth. It's, re it's flattened off a lot in recent years, um, even declined a little bit. But 2023 was a lot better, and I think 2023, again, benefiting from external factors, gave some breathing space to many in that industry. Um, and I think looking forward, at least from a revenue perspective, we see it a little bit more positively as, as volumes continue to come into that sector. But we have to caveat that and say, firstly, these products mainly get exported. They need to go through our ports, so we need to sort that out to enable growth. Um, and secondly, this doesn't do costs. So if we flip to the next one, we'll give you some view on costs. On the left-hand side, we've got some main cost drivers, not all of them, but and they're sort of color-coded here. So we've got fuel, fertilizer, herbicides, insecticides. Those are your core ones on the field crop side. On the gray ones, we've got labor, electricity, which speaks to irrigation. Those are obviously big drivers on the horticulture side, and then, and then feed and green. Those are all contrasted with the CPI, and I think that's a clear first point, that, that costs have increased well above CPI levels historically. Contrast that on the right-hand side. We've got some prices, again, major field crops, some horticultural products, and our livestock. And then comes the second point that for the most part, these costs have been a lot stronger than what we've seen on the price side. 
So if we look at the outlook for these, the core imported ones, you know, your, your fertilizer, which is imported, your herbicides, pesticides, some of them are still coming down. If the RAND strengthens a little bit more, maybe they'll come down a little bit more. In the medium term, we are looking at, at increasing again, roughly 1.5% per annum on average over that 10-year period from the levels we're now. So we dip, dip a little bit and then we, we grow a little bit stronger. Feed, of course, we do expect to come down with those grain prices, but we have to acknowledge there's also a cost to manufacture feed. Um, and then the horticulture ones, again, these are a little bit more sticky. If you think electricity tariffs, I can't imagine they'll be below inflation soon. And if you think wages, I also can't imagine that they'll be below inflation soon. So I think that sector is probably the most exposed in terms of, of rising cost structure, um, at least over the next few years. Much of what sits underneath this is also global dynamics, and I think here yeah, we've taken a really long-term view on world prices, again in real terms, so adjusted for inflation. We've gone back 50 years, we can also go back 100 years, the trend is the same, real agricultural commodity prices are coming down. We have seen spikes, um, the latest of which is, is, is the one that we saw in the recent past with the pandemic and, and, and um, logistical constraints and the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, but we are, we've seen them start to come down, um, and, and we'll show that also a little bit later on. We've had a lot of area expansion as those prices rose. We had some tough weather to start. Now the weather's playing along, and we're looking at record crops this year for most major grains and oil seeds at a, at a global level. So those prices are coming down, and I think if you just look at that trend long term, it's clear that if you're not growing productivity, you're going to be in real trouble. I think the good news is we still have an agricultural sector globally, so we've managed to do this in the past. We just need to sustain it. Um, the other side of it that also drives a little bit of a decline again um, in, in the outlook in real terms is that the demand side is also slowing. And I think if you look globally, there's multiple factors that we should consider in terms of, of driving demand. Um, we've highlighted some of them here. Of course, there's a global economy. Um, we are looking at slower growth. We, we've seen um, Shannon's presentation there. There are risks in, in many places. What also came out from hers, and I don't take this from her, this is actually from the OECD FAO outlook, um, is, is that the role of, of, China, of India and Southeast Asia is increasing compared to China. So if we look back to the past 10, 15 years, China was the core primary driver of demand in the agricultural space. The population is expected to decline, their growth is slowing, so that role is getting comparatively smaller. And you've got rising stars, as, as Shannon called it, in, in India and Southeast Asia that's increasingly playing a role. Now why this is important is because, of course, income levels will, have it, will, will influence it. Um, but your general demand trends and, and, and what people like to eat and so forth in these regions is not always the same. If you think of India, there's a, there's a big vegetarian population. So there's a lot of other factors to consider in terms of what the demand mix might look like. Of course, other things, the, the, the geopolitical fragmentation, the trade environment, it makes the international trade environment complex. Um, and, and you'll see from this presentation that we need that international trade environment to grow. Um, so that's an important point. And then, of course, sustainability. Matlo mentioned right at the beginning that it's, it's high on the agenda, so it's influencing the demand mix, it's influencing the demand for things like vegetable oils that go into biofuel. Um, it's, you know, you know, it's driving that side, it's driving the policy space in many instances. If you think like a region like the EU, it's quite influential in, in their agricultural policy to the extent that it may influence pros prospects for productivity growth in that region, which can again influence um, prices and so forth. So if we come back home, I guess, um, the, the situation's not, not much better. Um, so this speaks to the South African demand, demand environment. And, and again, consumer demand is still under a lot of pressure. I feel like we say this every year. I also feel like it's getting progressively worse. Um, so if you just look at that chart, that's household disposable income expressed in per capita terms. Nominal in blue, real in green, and a percentage change year on year in orange. So I think the orange is the one worth looking at. And firstly, from 2013 to 2023, there's only 0.3% in real terms there. So only 0.3% more than inflation in, in income. Um, if you look at a count back of the 10 years, five of them were negative. Um, so we had five positive, five negative. We had one big contraction in COVID. We had one big bounce back after. The rest is, 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 is marginally negative or marginally positive. 
The implication of that is if we just look at living standards, if you, we're plotting there the share of the South African population that falls in low income groups, middle income groups, and more affluent groups. Um, and I think this is a really striking picture. So if you look back in history, we were coming down on the lower, rising in the middle, and, and rising in the upper. Now we have sort of plateaued, marginally increasing on the lower, flattened off almost completely on the middle and declining um, on, on, on the upper. So this is, of course, a concerning picture if you just think spending power within your, your population. And, and this influences what people buy, um, how much of things they consume, and, and so forth. So it's, it's very important um, to consider in our agricultural outlook. Here you see some of the impact of that. So the chart on the left, again, that shows just over the past five years, the percentage change in consumption domestically, not internationally, and the percentage change in production of some core agricultural commodities. So we've tried to put a spread there. We've got uh, some fruits, we've got potatoes, we've got dairy products, some core grains, uh, meat products. And I think the first striking point is just how many of them are negative for that five-year period. The second one is probably which ones are positive. Um, so maize and wheat as core staples stands out. And, and we see that we've seen a stronger demand for those basic food staples and a weaker demand for your higher value products. Um, this would suggest that consumers are spending back to are switching back a little bit to basics. I think there are some positives there. Look at pork. Um, that's obviously the one, of, one of our, our meat types that's grown very quickly. It has become relatively a lot more affordable compared to other meat types, and that's part of what underpins that picture, why we see rising consumption, um, whereas others have, have predominantly declined. So I think this is, you know, if, if our economic performance increases, if it improves, if we're looking at a faster growth rate, of course the situation can turn around a little bit quicker. But for the most part, over the past five years, we've grown production a lot stronger than what we've seen domestic demand grow. So we have operated in international markets. We can, and we will have to. I think if we, you know, in the short term at least, if we want to accelerate growth, this has to be core to our strategy.